Welcome to another episode of Mysteries Unknown. I've got a great podcast for you guys tonight. I got Tyler with me. And Tyler had a really unique Class A encounter with Bigfoot on a property in Fredericksburg, Texas. Matter of fact, he's had several encounters with this creature or several creatures on the property that he's going to be talking about tonight. And then also later on in the podcast, he talks about a pretty unique encounter he had when he was just a kid uh, while he was out fishing. So we're going to get into all of that. But before I do, I just want to say thank you for being here. I appreciate all the support. If you have a mystery or an encounter you want to send me, you can send it to me by email at mysteriesunknownpodcast at gmail.com. Let's jump right into the story. Tyler, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, man, I'm super excited to have you here. I know you've had four different encounters that you're going to talk about tonight that happened uh, around Fredericksburg, Texas. So why don't you just start at the beginning and walk us through these encounters? Well, the first one, I don't remember the exact year. I know I was, I believe, a junior in high school. Um, It was in November. And we had just started setting up deer feeders and stuff for the upcoming deer season um, for ourselves. And then we also have or had hunters at the time that would come in and, you know, pay for bucks or sometimes does whatever um we had problems with some raccoons and some other pests that were messing with the deer feeders so i had some friends of mine come over and uh, we decided to go varmint hunting and um the night that we went it was a friday night after school actually we didn't see a single thing not one animal was out no eye shine no sounds nothing um which considering we had already put some corn in the feeders which is how we knew we had uh, pest problems was a little peculiar. Uh, we didn't see even a deer that night and you almost always saw deer cause we had several bedding areas on the property. Um, we walked the entire 200 acres and that property was kind of like a giant piece of pie. It was narrow in the front where the entrance was and it kind of widened out in the back. The whole thing was maybe 500 yards wide, but it went back 200 acres. If that makes sense. Uh, so we walked the whole thing. We didn't want to make any noise. We wanted, you know, element of surprise on anything uh, that we found. Saw absolutely nothing. We decided to walk back. And that property is sectioned off into thirds. So we got to the first gate at the back of the property, heading back toward the house. And we just had a really odd feeling that something was watching us. Uh, there were three of us in the group. So myself and two friends. Uh, all we had with us were just 22 rifles. Nothing crazy, nothing powerful. Um, we kind of chalked it up to just, it's late at night, it's dark, all we have are flashlights, small guns, we're tired, you know, mind playing tricks on us, whatever. Um, so we kept going, we made it probably about two thirds of the way back. We had gone through one section of brush, this, this kind of split. So see if you can even see my hands here. There's a section on that property that's got a stock tank that used to have uh, the pond is here. There used to be a spring or a creek that would come through, hit it here, and then it came out the back and went around in the drainage area. And then that went into the neighbor's place on our side of that where we were walking from. So the pond is here. There are two thickets that kind of parallel each other. Um, and on the right side that was a little more open. We decided to walk through that thicket on our way back to see if we could jump up anything. When we got to that brush line, the feeling of something watching us changed, uh, went from eyes in the back of your head to just something wasn't right. So like I know myself and, uh, I know at least one of my friends, both of us were telling me, uh, telling each other, it's kind of hard walking back through these memories because a lot of stuff happened that I'm still questioning to this day, and I wish I would have questioned it back then. But the hair on our arms and backs of our neck and everything just stood on end. And we kept going, not thinking much of it. We got through that thicket, and we kind of walked through the uh, creek bed that I had mentioned. It was dry. So we walked through there, and when we got to the other side, we heard a loud crashing sound, like a branch or something had been broken or, or knocked down. So... We were kind of somewhat freaked out at that point. We were underarmed for anything that might have been big enough to come after us. Uh, my mind went to mountain lion. Um, so I had all three of us put random music on our phones and just be as loud as we could, try to make ourselves look big. 
And I had my two friends continue walking forward while I turn around and I walk backward to make sure if it was a mountain lion, it wasn't going to come up behind us. And when I shined back at the area we had just come through in that thicket right before we got to that creek bed, something took off. And my instinct, I, I just told them, let's go. And we took off after it thinking that, OK, if it's on the run now, we can scare it and it will leave us alone and we can get the next 600, 700 yards back to the house and not have to worry about something jumping at us. So I hit the brush line first and I think I maybe made it in 15, 20 yards. And on the right side, we had a, uh, I don't know if you've seen the big wooden spools that they use for like the, the electrical lines for power lines and stuff. We had one of those as a table that we would use during the dove season. So we'd put all of our shotgun shells and you know all that stuff on that table. We weren't far from that and I happened to hear this loud crack on my right side, like a impact and then wood breaking. And I happened to look over with my flashlight thinking something was running, you know, hit a dead tree limb or a dead tree. And I see a, an oak tree, it's a post oak, a little yay big around that was still alive. And I'm just, I'm five foot 10. So it boots, I'm almost six foot tall. And I couldn't reach up and touch where the spot was that this tree broke and it falls over right in front of me. And I just, Basically, it's like, guys, we got to go. We're not set up to deal with anything that's that big. And we took, took off the other direction and we sprinted the entire distance back to the house, which is well over 500 yards. I'm going to say probably six to 700 in total. Because um, I know the field that was between the house and that section of pasture was 500 yards long. And we were both, all three of us were all out of breath by the time we made it back to the house. And we were kind of in shock. We didn't really know what to think. But we didn't know any better at the time, so we just chalked it up to maybe it was a big cat. Maybe it tried climbing the tree, and there was a bad, like a dead spot in the tree or whatever, and it fell over. And that was kind of where we left it. We never talked about it after that. Um, and that was really about it as far as experiences at that time. Fast forward, oh, 2019, and my now wife and I were engaged and we had decided to rent on that same property. Um, so we had a little spot that we were renting and then my parents were renting in a different in a house on that same place. But we decided to rent there because it was like 450 bucks a month. And we also had a spot for her donkey. Uh, she's got a, about a 500 pound donkey that she's Western and English trained for saddling and, and all kinds of stuff. She's done a whole bunch of different stuff with it. So we had all the space that we needed for the animals that she had. And we were outside one night. Um, this time we were in, I'm going to say it was April, but it might have been May. And that's going to be important later on down the road as I keep going through my experiences. We heard this sound. It's like 10, 15 at night. And I, I don't know how to describe what I heard. At first I thought a bird it's of, of some kind, but I, I didn't recognize it. I thought, well, that's weird. And then it did it again. And I was like, wait. That's that's not a bird. Like I know whippoorwills, owls. Like I've seen all of them. I usually have, actually have a picture of a great horned owl that we found on that property that was so well camouflaged you couldn't see it unless you really knew where to look. But I I couldn't picture that sound. I could not put it with any animal that I I was aware of. And we stood there listening to it for thirty minutes, and um, it kind of just made you get goosebumps. It was a, just a, a sound that that. You could tell it wasn't aggressive, but it was like a, like a, I don't know, like it was calling to something else. And it was loud enough that you could kind of feel it almost vibrating in the air around you. Um, and that's how I kind of pinpointed where it was at on the other side of the road, uh, the county road on the neighbor's place. And it was moving back and forth between these old growth pecan trees. And it, was moving faster than it should have been able to but it was on the ground but it was also loud enough that i could kind of get an idea that this wasn't a ground like a like a small animal so whatever it was was up off the ground at least my height or more to be making that noise from the direction it was coming from and it like i said the first night we heard it, it went on for about half an hour and then it quit um and then the next night, almost the same time, about 10.30 roughly, 
we heard it again, but this time we heard something answer it in the distance. It was so far away, you could barely hear it, but it was the exact same sound. So it would be like a perfect echo if you were in a area where you could, you know, throw your voice. It was almost identical, just it was so far away that I was shocked we could even hear it. And then the one that was closest to us started responding to it. So they were talking to each other over a pretty good distance. And this is also going to come into play again with the time frame. So the first encounter was before deer season, kind of going into winter. And this second one that's noteworthy was in spring. The sound that the uh, distance noise was coming from just so happened to be in the same direction as where my in-laws place is at right now which is out toward Enchanted Rock. We were out toward uh, Tyvendale Road. So that was, that's a, I'm not saying that the second sound, the one responding in the distance was that far away, but it was in that general direction. I'm not sure of distance because it, like I said, it was so far off. I could just barely make it out. And I tried getting a recording and I could only get the one uh, that was closest to us. And I don't have that recording any longer. Uh, but that's what I was talking about earlier that I had posted somewhere on Facebook and had people asking questions and that went down a rabbit hole. I didn't want it to go down. Um, so we just kind of left it at that because the, the response I was getting while I was asking questions as to what it could be was kind of pushing me in a, in a direction I wasn't comfortable with at the time. Um, we moved from that place. We got our own apartment because we got tired of living out there. Um, we had a place for our animals. It was a little better. You know, nothing really happened the next couple of years. Um, and then my parents ended up coming into 17 acres out on Lower Crab Apple Road, which is not far from the same place that my in-laws live. So they offered us some acreage um, that they would deed to us, basically, if we wanted to come out there and try to save money, get a house, all that stuff. So we did that. We got a, a, a pretty good sized RV and we built our own hookups and stuff back behind their house. That way it wasn't, you know, a view, a view from the road. Um, then that's what we did for about two years. As we lived in that RV, we were saving money. I actually had my own business going at the time. We were doing pretty good. And we, uh, we started doing more, um, animal projects, uh, rabbits and stuff for 4-H. So we had a decent operation going with that. We had some ducks and things. And we started having problems with feral pigs coming in and messing with cages, rabbit cages. They were going into the duck pen at night. They would lift up the cattle panel and T-post and go in there. They'd eat the eggs and the feed and tear things up. And then so I got kind of used to going outside at night, either with a shotgun or whatever I had basically laying around uh, and dealing with pigs because they just would not quit. And we were there about two years and had been dealing with that pretty much on a regular basis. At that point, my wife would go from, please be careful to, I'll bring you ammo if you run out. She was counting shots. That's how many pigs we had out there. She would count and be like, oh, he's out. He's out of his backup mag. I need to take him some more ammo. One night, my dog that I had, I used to have a, uh, a Blue Lacey mix, and um, he hated pigs. She, she just did not like pigs. And she'd bark, and she'd let me know they were out there. Um, she actually had a couple that would try to get into her pen to fight with her. And that's where she would bark and alert me and I'd go out and deal with them. She barked one night. I don't remember the time frame. Um, it was closer to winter. I just don't remember the exact month anymore. But the, her bark that she had was, was not her usual alert. Like, hey, they're back kind of a deal. She was mad and scared and you could tell just by the tone of her barking that something outside was just not right and i kind of thought well we've had people trespass in the past try to steal from us i wonder if there's a person back there and she's not happy about it so i grabbed my shotgun and i always keep three inch magnum double up bucks so you got 15 pellets of hell coming down at whatever you're shooting at and i opened the door to our camper and about 40 yards away there's Pretty good size. I think it was a blackjack oak. Um, I don't know, about three feet in diameter. Pretty good size tree. And I just see this thing, this mass standing there. It's just dark, black. I can't tell color or anything. My light wasn't strong enough to really illuminate it well enough for me to see much other than just this large mass that was not supposed to be there. And my first thought is that's a really big pig. 
And uh, I started kind of going out of the camper to try to figure out how to deal with it. And it turned like I could see shoulder movement. And I just stopped. I was like, wait a minute. Okay, is this a person? And then it kind of was registering. But at that moment, deep down, my, my brain knew something was wrong. And I kind of shut down. Um, I don't know how else to explain it. Whatever was there turned and it had shoulders. But I mean, I'm about 26 inches here. And this was substantially wider than I am. And uh, it, it turned and went behind the tree and it was just gone. And I couldn't see it. And I was like, you know, I'm not, I'm not even going to go down there right now to figure out what that was. I don't, I don't want anything to do with whatever that is. I have a wife and a, and a little boy that I need to be thinking of, not, you know. So I just told my wife, like, whatever it is it left, we're, we're going to look at it in the morning. So she's, we all went back to sleep, woke up the next morning, and I had her stand almost in the exact same position that I had been standing in the night before. And I went down to that tree and I marked where I could see the top of it. And, uh, it was a lot bigger than I initially thought. I estimated it to be like four feet tall in the dark. I didn't see that there was a drop off that it was standing behind. So it was closer to about seven feet, maybe more. And I didn't have an answer. She's like, well, what do you think it is? And I was like, I, I don't, I don't know. Nothing out here should be that big. Nothing. You know, I grew up hunting and fishing and all that. And I was never taught that there were giant bipedal things out in the woods that you needed to watch out for. So like nothing that I'm aware of should be able to even pass that kind of a presence. So from then on, I stopped using a shotgun for that at night. I went to a 30-30 rifle just in case. Um because I was genuinely concerned, but we never actually had any problems with whatever that was. It was like it was passing through the area and it was curious as to, well, this is new. There's a house here and there's all these these things that were never here before. Because prior to us being there, nobody had really been on that property probably 60 years. So it was all overgrown until we went in and kind of cut out areas for a house and stuff like that. And um, that was where I started kind of going down that rabbit hole again of what, what am I experiencing? And it, are these isolated events that I'm seeing connected in any way? And then kind of fast forward several years later, I worked at a, an organic produce farm out in Stonewall, um, off and on different times for about three years collectively. And the last time I was out there uh, helping them out, I was checking fences because we kept having crops get destroyed by primarily deer, but we would also have stuff that would just completely disappear. Whole we'll plant, everything gone out of the ground. No evidence of it even ever having been there. And it'd be anything from carrots to entire tomato plants to squash to okra to just all kinds of stuff. Um, and it was too random to be deer doing that. The deer were in there consistently any chance they could get, and we had kind of patterned them. So we'd go up there and scare them out, or if it were during the deer season, we would harvest what we could legally. And then, again, we were just trying to scare them out of there while we were working on the deer-proof fence because it hadn't been maintained. So I'm checking that fence one day because we had deer get in the night before, and I found a basically a whole tree on the fence. And I thought, well, it must have fallen over in the wind because there's a there's a slope right here. So I could see how a, a pretty good gust of wind, if this tree is old, maybe pushed it out of the ground. And there's no hole. There's no root ball. There's there's nothing there, even remotely close to that size. The tree was heavy enough. I couldn't move it at all. And it was balanced on the netting. It wasn't on the ground in either way. It's perfectly balanced, free floating, just on the deer proof netting. And then pushed it down to about about my stomach's height. So a seven foot tall fence pushed down to about three and a half feet by that tree. I had to take a, a pretty powerful chainsaw because it was a hardwood. I can't remember if it was, I think it was an oak and I had to cut it out in sections. And when I got half of it cut off, I was able to just barely push it off the fence. That's how heavy it was. Um, something put that there. It was the only thing I could come up with and I don't want to meet whatever was strong enough to lift that because that was about 15 feet of 36 inch wide hardwood tree that was just placed there. And all the limbs had been broken off the top 
and the root ball had been ripped out of the ground. But like I said, I my first thought was it had to have been the wind and it just blew it over. But I looked for like two or three hours. I could not find anywhere near there where there was a hole in the ground, broken roots, anything that told me that, oh, well, this is where that tree came from. It just wasn't there. And then the next week, basically, because I had to do pretty regular checks on the fence, it's there. And it's, again, perfectly balanced like a teeter-totter on this netting. And that that was noteworthy in that it happened at around the same time frame toward deer season again. And I keep bringing that up because from what I've picked up, whatever this is, is migrating through here through winter and spring. This is not a stop, but it's a it's like part of the travel route. And we have a river that comes through here. Uh, and most of these experiences, by the way, the crow flies, they're not that far from the river. So anything that can navigate, you know, like birds use magnetism a lot to migrate long distances. If it can have an idea of where that river is at at all times, then it would make sense to me that it would be able to navigate and not have to stick to that body of water. Um, you know, they could be a few miles away and still have a general idea, especially if it's learned knowledge of where they're going. And that's where I think that first, and that's not the first, but the second encounter with those vocalizations, I think one had lost sight of its group and was trying to figure out where they were. And they ended up being able to get within earshot of each other in, in communicating. Um, and that place that I mentioned earlier that my in-laws have, we've heard some vocalizations there just this year um, around us. And one of them involved the neighbor's uh, Great Pyrenees guardian dogs. Uh, those dogs went nuts and in a way that we weren't familiar with because we've seen the dogs, had some unfortunate experiences with them coming over and killing rabbits and stuff. And uh, one of the dogs barked and you could tell it was an aggressive bark. And then something made this growl for lack of a better term, that I could feel in my chest as if it was right in front of me is how loud it was. It was like, that's, that's, that has to be almost the same thing as what we heard years ago. Different sound, but like it, it vibrated everything around it in the same manner. Uh, and I actually put that on one of the groups that I'm in on Facebook because I was freaking out. I needed to just tell somebody. So I just put it on there and let people know. And we heard it a couple of other times, but it's been quiet. And I, I'm noticing that whatever these are, they're moving through in specific time frames following the seasons. So I think at this particular point, like they're not in the area uh, anymore, at least as far as I know. Um, exactly. I think this is and I don't think they do it consistently all the time, especially now that we have so much more development around here. And that's led me down all these rabbit holes where I came to the thought that it might be an actual like Bigfoot set of circumstances, I guess, that I've, I've experienced is when I started looking up and just like Googling some of the stuff that happened, a bunch of stuff from like the Pacific Northwest and Alaska popped up and, and, it, and it all was like, well, this was a Bigfoot encounter from so-and-so. And it's like, wait a minute. I didn't think we could get those here. Like I, if that's an actual thing and I'm, open-minded to quite a bit. I, I don't think that we've discovered everything there is to discover. There is so much to this world. We just don't, we don't understand, man. And you know, your, your class A encounter that you had there on the property when you went outside, it reminds me a whole lot of mine, man. I, I had something really similar, black figure standing there and didn't know what to do with it. But it, you know, there's a lot to unpack there, man. And we'll go into all that, but I always like to ask my guests, man, how did that, how has this affected your life? Knowing that this is out there, you know, knowing that this has been through your property, close to your family, how did that affect you? I kind of take it in stride with, you know, we already have dangerous animals around here. Primarily uh, in our area, it's it's going to be feral pigs. I mean, um, I've had people that I've known that have been mauled by them. So I kind of approach it with whatever that is, has the potential. It's big enough. If it wanted to, it could hurt somebody. But respect it. Don't fear it. And when my son is a little older, he's, he's, he's not old enough right now to be out of that everything is scary phase. Uh, I want to try to just tell him, you know, hey, like there's some things that I've experienced that you might want to be aware of if you're going to go camping or fishing or hunting or hiking or whatever. It's a, it's a part of creation. And um, it's been here for a while. Um, it hasn't really changed my mindset on 
I'd rather be outside than sitting inside. I'd rather be out, you know, hiking up and down the river. When I say I go fishing, I'm not talking about in the boat. I go down to the river bottom and I, I walk for miles sometimes fishing. Um, that's something I've done since I was a kid. And I've always loved doing it that way. And, and seeing and experiencing these things hasn't deterred me from wanting to do that. But I now carry that, I guess, knowledge or, or those experiences in my mind. And, and my goal when I wake up in the morning is I got to come home to my family the same way that I left them. What do I need to carry on my person at all times to make that happen? So I open carry now. It's constitutional here in Texas. So I, I, I've always got that in mind. I'm like, OK, if something if I'm out fishing or whatever is going to come after me, I have tools to defend myself. And I should be OK with that. But that's that's a worst case scenario type thing. Like I'm not going to be the guy that goes out there and is, is actively trying to shoot something that nobody is even sure what it is yet. Uh, I'd rather get it on a, on a camera or something like that and be like, look, this is completely clear and focused and you can't argue with it. Here's the timestamp. Go ahead and try to disprove it. I don't want to be dragging a body out of there uh, for somebody to look at. I'm not that, I'm not that kind of person. I think that's smart, man. Cause I, I think that, these creatures, you know, if, if they want to get you, they're going to get you. And I don't think there's a whole lot you could do to, to stop that. But man, I really am glad that it, you haven't lost your love for the woods or, or the ability to go out into the woods, man. I know I talked to a lot of guys that it absolutely takes that from them. You know, um, you know, you combine the, the, like you said, in your first encounter, that feeling of dread and then seeing this thing, it's a pretty daunting thing, man. Pretty scary, especially something that's not supposed to be there. Um, did you happen to smell anything in that first encounter when you guys heard all that? We did not. Um, I, I did kind of ask if anybody like had anything happen that I was not aware of and that never was mentioned. And I personally didn't smell anything. Um, when we saw or when I saw that thing standing outside of our camper that night, again, I didn't smell anything. Now, we would get odors from time to time on that particular property where – it wasn't pigs because pigs have a smell. Um, like when I was really little, my parents raised pigs to sell at auction uh, before that market collapsed. And so I got familiar at a young age with what they smell like. And wild pigs are no different. They're very similar. You can always tell when it's a wild pig around. You can, it's, it's a very distinct smell. And most people don't around here don't like it. Um, the odor that would come through would just be different. I don't, I don't really know how else to describe it. It wasn't overpowering it wasn't necessarily pleasant but it wasn't the worst thing that i've ever you know had waft through the air around me um but we only ever had that one real encounter on that place um i had a couple of things that charged at me in the brush and i couldn't ever see what they were but warning shots into the ground would usually deter anything from happening so i mean that could have been a pig uh, or any number of other things. I never saw anything. So that's why I'm not, I'm not ready to say, well, that was, you know, a Bigfoot. Of, I, I don't know. I'm guessing it was more than likely a pig. I've had those run at me and that's, that's not a pleasant experience. No, man. The, we have those here in Arkansas, man. And they'll, they'll do that. They're, they're brutal, man. They will, they will mess you up. They're no joke. So it sounds like you got a lot of activity on the property, man, and, and in that whole area. And it makes sense that they would kind of migrate through there because they have water, they've got food source, they got, you know, they're able to hide all the things that they need that's on there. Um, I'm curious if you have ever heard the uh, Sierra Nevada sounds. And if you have, if that was anything like what, what you heard. I want to say I have it. I'd have to go back and try to find it and play it again. The one that, now, granted, I, I watch some of the like the Bigfoot shows and whatnot. I, it's primarily for entertainment. Uh, most of them, in my opinion, are completely fake. Uh, the one that, to a certain degree, I think has some some um, reality to it was when Les Stroud went out and kind of was trying to get answers for his own experiences. I agree with a lot of this stuff up until he gets to that mind speak part. And then I'm like, eh. I don't know. You know, is it possible? Maybe, but I don't know that I want to go into that. Like, but he caught a sound on one of his episodes and part of it was very similar to what we heard that night where they were talking to each other. Um, it wasn't the whole audio. It was just a very small fraction of it where I was like, that's the same tone, pitch, almost everything. And then it changed in his, in his clip and, 
that's where I was like, okay, that now the the similarities are, are now gone. Um, in my in my mind, I'm like, well, no two animals sound the same, just like no two people sound the same. So two different individuals, different vocalizations for different reasons, probably, and two different voices, essentially. So you know, my my thing is. I don't like to use the word family when I refer to these things, you know, because I, I just, I don't like using that word for that, but I think they are, you know, family oriented or whatever you want to say. Uh, but, you know, they were probably communicating back and forth. And, and that's, I have this theory, you know, like it, this is just from talking to a lot of people, but if you see one, you can bet that there's another one pretty close by. And I think your thoughts are probably right. That maybe it lost its way, lost sight of the, of the, you know, the other group or whatever, and was trying to communicate to get back to them. Um, it's pretty interesting, man. And it's a, it's a wild world. There's a lot that I just, I don't understand. And I think there's just so much here that we don't understand, but if you had the opportunity to, to see one again, you know, a class A signing again, would you want to? Absolutely. Um, when we were talking earlier, I mentioned, you know, looking for a place to get answers and this is one of those places, but the other part of that is my brother-in-law, uh, he's not had an experience yet, but he's one of those where he's seen other things. I can tell you some ghost stories that make your skin curl. Um, and he's very curious, uh, just like I am. And we're trying to figure out how we can put a trip together to go somewhere and try to have more of these experiences, maybe even get a couple documented. Um, I'm not going to say it's for closure. I think it's just because I'm a curious person with things. Of, if I don't understand it, I want to figure it out. And um, I'm having a really hard time saying that all of these experiences are anything other than, you know, what people call a Bigfoot sighting or an encounter, because they're so similar to what a lot of other people have experienced in other parts of the country. Uh, I've, I've even got a good friend that lives in Bernie. Uh, him and I are both into keeping reptiles and snakes and stuff. And so we talk quite a bit. And he's got an uncle that lives in Juneau, Alaska. And he said he was up there one time with um, his uncle helping him with some stuff. and. They were in that cabin out on the property one night and something hit or threw something at the side of that cabin and actually knocked one of the logs completely off the bottom of it. And, and it's one of the old school, like the, the older uh, ways of building them. So for something to have knocked and dislodged that whole log and, and made it fall off the cabin, that's that's a pretty big hit. Um, and he said that the next night they had rocks thrown at them. Um, and then another time he went up there, uh, his uncle parked all their like ATVs and stuff in a, in a row and they got to the property and he said that something had pushed the first one and pushed it into all the others and shoved them all up against the wall. And you could see the footprints of whatever that was. And it just pushed all of those ATVs like they weren't even there. Just shoved them into the wall and then turned and went off into the woods. That is wild. You know, the the thing that's crazy about this world is you start talking to a lot of people and, and I'm like you, man, when this, when I had my experience, you start digging into this and you end up walking away with more questions and answers. And I'm pretty curious too. So I, you know, try to figure stuff out, but there's too many similarities from people that are total strangers that tell these encounters. And there's so many things that line up and that's very similar that just, you got to know that there's more out there than just a, a normal animal. You know, their normal animals aren't going to do that kind of stuff. They're not going to have that kind of behavior. And so, you know, I, I know in law enforcement, man, we always looked at what was most, most probable, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire and you put pieces together and, and work the trace evidence and, and come up with your best answer. And I think you're definitely right. You, you have a group traveling through there, man. And, you know, for whatever reason they go through there and it makes me wonder, you know, where they go and, how often they come back, man. And so it's, uh, that's pretty interesting, man, but hopefully you'll get some answers and, and, you know, hopefully somebody's watching this podcast that can, uh, give you some answers. Cause I know it, uh, that's kind of stuff keeps you up at night. Yeah. I mean, and again, in my case, not so much a question of fear. It's just, what is it? What, what have I stumbled onto? Uh, I just, I want to know what it is. Um, and I actually, I apologize. I, I thought of something else that I, I ran into one time um, when I was actually back in middle school that I, to this day, don't have an explanation for. Um, we were talking earlier and I was mentioning the, the way I like to try to fish. And uh, I mean, I've been doing that since I was God, probably six or seven years old. So where we used to live at um, out toward Enchanted Rock, a little bit further than where my in-laws property is, 
um, one of the neighbors had property at the very back of this country, like this county road, essentially just a long driveway that the county kept paved. And um, they always had given us permission to go back there and fish. And so I went back one day. Uh, my dad was doing some side work for him, building or adding some stuff onto a hunting cabin. So I rode back there with him. And I decided to look for one of their stock ponds that I hadn't found yet. And um, I was following the creek, using that as kind of like a way to figure out, just trace it back, go against the current and trace it up to where this thing is supposed to be. And the creek, at that particular point where I started feeling something was wrong, got real shallow, which is kind of normal. It's a, it's a spring-fed creek. So I'm, I'm figuring that was probably where like part of the spring came out of the ground. Um, I noticed this shape from in, in the distance, like over the water, and it got closer and closer to it. It was, I don't know what kind of grass, but I sometimes just call it marsh grass or razor grass. If you grab the leaves and you try to pull on it, it's going to slice you to the bone. Um, but it gets pretty tall, sometimes six, seven feet tall if nobody cuts it or anything. And it was growing along the creek in this one little section where it kind of bent and it had been taken, it wasn't pulled out of the ground or broken, but it had been taken, bent over, and woven together where the two openings to it were over the, the water. And um, I never really could figure out why. Like if it was a shelter, why build it where you're going to get wet and uncomfortable? Uh, so I was looking at this thing, and I just started to get the feeling that something was watching me. And it was not a like a normal, uh, something's looking at me like a, a regular it was instant dread you need to leave and right now and um the only thing i had on me for their protection at that time was just a hunting knife and i would primarily use that to cut fishing line and stuff so i started walking back the way i came and it felt like it was following me and i'd look and i couldn't see anything and that was not a heavily wooded area it's pretty open it's very rocky and, and kind of you know you had some ups and downs some hills and things like that but there was nothing to conceal behind and I couldn't see anything. Um, so I kept walking. I picked up the pace, started walking a little faster and it was like keeping pace with me. I, st I stopped, couldn't see anything. And I go even faster. I'm almost trotting at this point, like almost jogging, carrying tackle bag, fishing poles. You know, it's a pretty decent amount to be trying to run with. And it feels like it's right behind me. Like I could could have sworn I felt breath on the back of my neck. And I dropped everything and pulled my knife out and spun around. There's nothing behind me. And I, I could hear it and feel it right there. Like it was about to reach out and grab me. And there was absolutely nothing there. I don't think I've ever run so fast in my life. I jumped over the widest part of that creek. Like I, I probably looked like I was in the Olympics. I just vaulted over it. I have no idea if I lost anything out of that bag. If I did, I'd never notice because I didn't want to go back to find it. And I, I told my dad, which my dad's very skeptical on everything that's not concrete, set in stone, you know, and he's like, well, I'm not actually, I'm not going to laugh at you because something happened to me like that on a different part of this property a while ago. And I thought it was just because I was close to the Indian burial ground that was here. And I was like, oh, great. Did I walk through it? He goes, well, no, because I know where that's at because there was a college that had come out and done a dig on it. So he knew right where it was at. He goes, where you were, you were quarter of a mile away so whatever was there I, I still don't have a good explanation for it but it, the one of the theories that i mentioned earlier when we were messaging each other uh, one of the other uh people you had on the podcast mentioned that show uh expedition bigfoot and again take it all with 10 grains of salt because if it's on tv it's most likely for entertainment only but it got me to thinking about something. They were talking about the exact thing he was talking about where they're capturing shadows on film and there's there's no way for that shadow to be there. They're not seeing a physical body between the camera and the shadow. People can say whatever they want because it's still, you know, it's a theory. There's, there's no real evidence there other than just a few things that I'm trying to put pieces together on. But it made me wonder if because one of the things they were talking about was if, if these things can bend the light and uh, nine times out of 10, if you're like me, your, your mind's going to go to like some sci-fi video game, you know, something completely ridiculous. But it got me to thinking we have animals that can change color with pigments and different things. 
And then you have animals like hummingbirds that can beat their wings so ridiculously fast that it looks like they don't even have them most of the time when they're flying right in front of your face. What if these creatures have a, an ability with the, their natural hair and a, a specialized muscle that can vibrate that and create some sort of a distortion that to a some degree can kind of give them the ability to not you know not appear like they're there um because there's a few like the night that i saw that creature by the tree when it turned to leave it was so wide i should have seen it kind of come around the back of that tree even a little bit and go down the hill and i never saw anything it just it turned and was gone and to be that tall where i'm seeing several feet of it above that little hill like where did it go how did it how did it just disappear when it was literally right in front of me? I didn't even blink the whole time that I was looking at this thing and it just is gone right in front of my face. So it was just a thought that popped into my head and a theory that I would like to just see if somebody else has a thought on that. Because to me, that's the only biologically feasible way that something could do that. You know, that's a good thought, man. I, I talked to a guy that has the same type of theory and he's doing some work with that. And so I need to get you in touch with him, but he, he has that theory, you know, he thinks it's something to do with uh, their skin and the way they're able to do something. And I don't know the science behind it. And, and I don't even know if that's true, but man, who knows? There's so many weird things with this stuff and, and it, that's a good theory. I, I've heard that twice now. So um, you're not alone in that. And you, you know, I'm sure he'd like to talk to you because this guy really knew his stuff when it comes to that. So I'll try to get you in touch with him, but you know, like with all that being said and those encounters and those experiences, you know, Tyler, what do you think this, these things are? What's your thoughts on it? I honestly, I don't know. Um, I, I can't really put a finger on what I think they are. Uh, I, I do think that in some ways they, they've got to be at least somewhat primate or humanoid, um, just kind of based on what I've seen personally and not really taking into, into consideration, you know, the, the other encounters that I've read on or seen or, or anything else. Um, just off the principle that we're like primates and humans are the only or bipedal creatures currently, other than a few birds and things like that. Like as far as upright walking things, especially on this continent, you're either going to be dealing with birds or humans or some form of a mammal that we don't really fully have the grasp of yet. I, you know, I don't know what it would be. I don't think that they're related to people. Um, and I'd be interested to see if anybody ever, like if they ever come out and said, you know, Hey, this is legit. It's real. Okay. Well, what, what are they, what are they? Are they related to, you know, some ancient ape species? Are they their own thing? Um, my mind is still open on that because I haven't seen enough detail of one yet to be like, you know what, this is exactly what I think it is. The The only visual encounter that I've had where I know it wasn't supposed to be there, I didn't get enough detail to, you know, I didn't get to see facial features or, you know, uh, hair color or other than just the fact that I could tell it had shoulders and arms and that it was standing upright. That's That's about all I got. And it would not. The other thing was it would not look at the light. To me, that's a learned behavior. I know raccoons, if you've ever been out coon hunting, if anybody on here ever has, if you have one that's been hunted before and you put a light on them, they'll turn and hide their eyes because they know you can see them in the dark because their eyes reflect light. And they will learn, okay, if I do this and I hide in this, this nook of this tree, they can't see me. So my chances of getting out of this are increased. Was that a learned behavior that this thing had or did it instinctually know, hey, don't don't look at the light, you know, because either way, it would not look at me. It kind of kept itself turned. It's like when the flashlight hit it, I could see the shoulders of the first thing that caught me because they were so wide. And then when I tried to kind of get an idea of where the head was at, it hit our, that's when I noticed that it was actually shoulders and it wasn't, you know, the length of some of the animal's body when it went to turn. That's where it was pulling its head from me where I couldn't see the face. I had never heard that before uh, about raccoons. I mean, I hunted deer and stuff as a kid, but 
you know, I didn't spend a whole lot of time doing any other kind of hunting. And so that's really interesting. And man, I don't know that, who knows, man, the thing of it is, is you always end up walking the right way. It seems like with more questions than answers. And, and so maybe someday we'll know, you know, I think these things lean into, to, to more spiritual thing uh, than they do physical, but man, nobody's an expert. Nobody knows for sure. There's a lot of opinions, a lot of good opinions, um, but it's the stuff that keeps you up at night and, and makes you wonder. And so I, I would love to hear from you again, man, if you, you know, have another encounter, come across anything, man, I, I would love to hear about it. So make sure to keep me in the loop. Yeah, I definitely will. Um, and again, there's some other stories that I have that are not Bigfoot related that are actually probably the reason why that doesn't scare me, to be honest. Some of them have been out in the woods and they're a lot more interesting. And those would be more of the areas where I'm like, eh, not sure if I want to go back to that particular spot. There's a lot of things, man, that, that happen in the woods that you just, you don't understand. Like I, I've been out in the woods, you know, I used to hike a whole lot and you go way out. I mean, way out. And, and there's times that you can just feel that you're not alone out there. I had a, I had a guy on the podcast. Uh, I think it was last week. He was from Alaska and uh, he was in the military police and he was out searching somewhere and he had a run in with he believed was a demon and he said this thing was the most daunting force he'd ever felt just straight fear and uh he went to try to get out and the gate was locked couldn't get it open really scary encounter he said that thing absolutely just you know changed his life because he he knew he wasn't alone it wasn't flesh and blood and you know there's a lot of things out there that are very scary and i've heard some really incredible encounters doing this and so you just don't know man what you're going to run out to you know when when you get out there so you, you need to be careful yeah definitely and you know that that coupled with what you were talking about with you know the bigfoot side of things probably being more spiritual i could see that um that gives a pretty good origin to something that we're having a hard time figuring out. And it even would go hand in hand with like, even my theory, if it's uh, a Nephilim or something of that realm, it would have abilities that we would not understand. Even if they are just biological, they're not in our normal daily routine. And, and we, as a, as a whole people, humans usually think that we know a lot and we really, we know very little in comparison to how much is out there and how much has been created. So, you know, I, I don't, I don't bat an eye at that. Yeah. There's a lot. We, we don't know. We don't understand. And I'm, I'm in that camp, you know, I think they're Nephilim fallen angels, something like that. Cause they just check off so many boxes, you know, would just make sense. But I also think maybe when they're here and they're physical, they're physical. That's why they do physical things. And then maybe when they, do all these other weird stuff that they do that it just, maybe that's why I don't, I don't know if you ever looked up or researched the woo, but, uh, you know, that's a whole other rabbit hole you can go down and, uh, you could talk, I could talk about this stuff forever, man. And, and I also have this theory that if you have one encounter with one of these creatures, your odds of having another one are really high. And you, you prove that, you know, you, with a kid having that kind of strange encounter and, and, you know, you're kind of your whole life, you've had stuff happen and so I talk to a lot of people, man, that, that do that. They have these experiences and then every few years something pops off. So it kind of makes you wonder why that is, you know. I think one reason potentially is is your your mind is open to it. It's happened once and you're aware of it. You know, uh, I mentioned earlier that I keep snakes. And one of the things that I try to do for people is because I don't like killing animals without a real, a real reason behind it. Um like, I don't even really go out varmint hunting anymore. Nine times out of ten, I'm going to try to scare it off or trap it and relocate it versus just shooting it. Um, I still hunt, but we do that for food because my wife and I both enjoy deer meat and things like that. But we re I relocate snakes for people whenever possible. you know. And so I've kind of gotten an eye now after a few years of doing that where I can see it out of the corner of my eye. And I'm like, oh, there's one right there. And somebody else will be like, where? I don't, I don't see it. And I'm like, well, it's. But my, my mind, my brain is looking for that even when I'm not thinking about it because I've been doing this now for a little bit. And so I think kind of in that same retrospect, you've had this experience with something and your brain is now like, OK, next time I'm going to I'm going to be more open. To that. I'm going to be aware of this. And I think you, you just kind of become more aware of what's just always been going on around you. And now you're like, OK, now I'm starting to put the pieces together. And that that goes hand in hand with all of my experiences. And the reason like I never thought for years that it had anything to do with Bigfoot was because 
I was like, oh, it's just another thing that happened and I don't have an explanation for it. But stuff like that happens all the time. It's no big deal. And then I start actually just kind of looking into it. I'm like, holy crap. No, this has been happening all over the place for a long time. And a lot of people are experiencing this and they're thousands of miles away from me. So, no, this is not normal. Like every day, this is what you're taught to, you know, to think. And, and I will say this, I guess, in retrospect to your question earlier, how it's changed me a little bit. It's changed the way I approach things and think about things, too. Um, I've always had an open mind to things that most people probably wouldn't. But it's even more so now just because I've experienced this and seen it firsthand. And I'm not you're not going to catch me laughing at anybody having had some sort of an experience with it, with anything really at this point. That's a good thought, man. And that's a good way to look at it. And that would make sense because, you know, once you see these things and you realize that they're there, you, you are more apt to see them. So that that makes a lot of sense, man. And, and, you know, thanks for being brave enough to come on here and talk about that because there's a lot of r ridicule out there when you when you do. And, you know, I'm trying to change that in, in any kind of way I can and give people a safe platform to do that. So thanks for coming on and, and sharing that with my audience. I know that they really enjoyed that. That was good, man. A lot of good information. Well, thank you for having me. And if something else happens i'll definitely let you know um so far it's just been hearing a few things nothing crazy yet so but if anybody out there watching this episode happens to know of a group or you know i know there's a couple of, of the groups on facebook that'll try to get together a couple times a year and like go out and look for stuff uh that's the kind of thing that i'm trying to, to get myself into with my brother-in-law um primarily so we both have somebody there that we know we can trust just as kind of a safety net type thing but we're both really curious. And so if we could find a place where just the two of us could go or, you know, in camp or whatever, or join a group, that'd be really cool. And definitely something that we're wanting to do. Well, man, we'll see if we can get you some answers. So thanks for coming on. And if you, like I said, keep, keep me up in the loop, man. If you see something in the future, or something else happens, let, let me know. I'd love to have you back on. So guys, uh, I know that you really enjoyed that. That was a great episode. If you know of anything can help Tyler out in any way, reach out to me. Uh, you can send me an email and I'll make sure to get it to him. You know, this world is crazy. And a lot of times it leaves us with a lot of questions and, and leaves us, you know, wondering stuff. So, uh, you know, just uh, get a hold of me and hopefully we can get him some answers. So thanks for being here tonight with this podcast. Uh, I appreciate each and every one of you guys. I could not do this without you. I appreciate all the support. You guys are awesome. Thanks for being here. And you know, I'm going to say it. Stay prayed up, guys. We'll see you in the next episode.